So without help outside, your story would have been impossible to have been told. There was, there was, there was cooperation everywhere. There was cooperation only within the camp. Nobody had to know outside. No, but, uh, no, but be, beyond when you then started making your way outside, then discussions were made. No, then. that was a long, a long way That's to go. Way off. That's a long way on. to go off okay. because we didn't have any electricity in the camp, but there were searchlights and there was an engineer, an electrical engineer. He knew the building from 1921 when the building was built. And it was on him, on this electrician, to find electricity to bring into the tunnel. Because no light would burn after 10 meters. When we started digging, there was no light possible. We put down lights and it came off. It wasn't enough oxygen. The tunnel was only 65 centimeter by 70 centimeter. In other words, crawling on the feet. It's only four people had to say the strength to dig. And they used to get extra Russian. People still had gold in the camp, and they traded in the gold for bread and other items, and the food went to the diggers, because they were the main. The people, they started off making a trolley first of all, with ropes. My father was at that time responsible to supply the rope uh, in the saddle workshop. And it went on the work, it started in May, 7th of May was a killing, so probably about the 10th or the 12th of May, 1943, the tunnel started to work. They dug for quite a while, and they came into various problems, whether we go straight or we can go up. So ever so often, there was a man responsible that he used to make a hole and watching from the loft to see in which direction it goes and to measure it. The next thing is to provide air for the diggers. The person with electricity, he found a cable and he brought in a cable. And on top of bringing in the cable, he made a switch that any time he wanted, he could switch off the light, the searchlight. And while the digging was on, he used to switch off the searchlight. They used to call him to look for repair. He came back, he said, it's a small fault and off and on, not to worry about it. So of course the police didn't trust him, so they used to bring uh, electricians from the town. And the electrician from the town, they used to come, it was off, and suddenly it came on again. They said, well, it's, it's a small fault, don't worry about it. And so it went on. They make 100 meter we dug. The digging was done during the day and during the night. My blanket, for instance, which I had, was taken away, and the tailors made it into bags. And the bags was filled up with earth, and everybody stand, stood in a line and carried it to the loft. The loft was reinforced, that shouldn't break down, and so 100 meters was dug. And when 100 meters was dug, unfortunately, uh, 11 people were taken away from the camp, including my father. They took them to a place in Kodlicevo, which later he was killed. When 100 meters was dug, a list was made who should escape first and so on. And the Germans came the following day practically with a tractor and cut off the wheat. It means they are in trouble. They can't escape because whichever way it is, from the uh, posts where, where they had machine gun, they, will be, they are visible. So a decision was made to dig another 150 meters. Nobody can imagine how much earth it's coming out from a small tunnel even like that. But they've managed, they dug, and they have, on the 26th of September, they have all escaped. Into where? The escape, when they came out from the tunnel, halfway, it was a very dark night, uh, the electrician switched off the searchlight and people disorientated. Instead of running towards the forest, they made a left turn and ran towards the camp. When the police saw movements, they opened fire with machine gun. From all four, five posts, five machine guns have opened fire. When I came out, I was in the middle, I heard already the machine gun going. When I came out, it was absolutely darkness. The arrangement was made not to go en masse. Each one should find its own way. 
We were terribly hungry. The forest was approximately 15 kilometers away, one of the main forests. If you could run the 15 kilometers, you were practically certain that you will survive. If you can't reach this forest, you might be in trouble. I knew that I can't make it. So I decided with a friend of mine to make a detour. Instead of running to the forest, to go 180 degrees around the town and stay a kilometer from the town. And so we did. When we came out, it was machine gun fire all over the place. We crossed the highway, we turned left and left again, and we came a kilometer from the town, and we couldn't walk anymore. That was the end of our strengths. And we stayed there. The ones who came to the forest managed easily to find partisans straight away. And there, we, I got to go back to the Belsky partisans, if I may. Please. This is, this is the story. This is the main story of yes. the Belsky partisans. In 1941, when the war broke out between Germany and uh, Russia, the family Belsky, which were four brothers, decided to go into the forest, not to go to Novogrudek at all, and not to be German slaves. And they settled in, in a forest, they knew many, many farmers, and they brought their families, their cousins and so on, to the forest as well, and there were 20 people. And they stayed there in the uh, 7th of August massacre. The Germans have taken away their parents. The parents didn't go with them in the forest, they were elderly people, and they killed them in Novogrudek. And they were determined to take revenge on what the Germans had done to their family. And they moved about from place to place. They didn't have any armaments, but they had good uh, Belarusian friends, which helped them with food. And that was till 1942, till the massacre started in Novogrudek, the second massacre. And they came to a farmer, and the farmer's name was Kozlovsky. He spoke Yiddish because his father, as a boy, he was working in uh, making shoes for a Jewish, uh, for a Jew, and he learned Yiddish. And Belsky told him, I want you to do me a favor. I want you to pass on a letter to the people in the ghetto. Whether the story is true or not, I don't know, but I think it is. That this Kozlovsky put on yellow stars front and back, and he was waiting for the party to go to the barracks to work. And he managed to get in with the people and got escaped the following day. Some people say that he just got a letter. But I believe that he managed to put on the star, and he gave a letter in the ghetto to 10 people to escape. He will take out 10 people from the ghetto. And it, the following day, he directed them to come to his farm, where the Belskis were waiting, and they were the first partisans to join Belsky. And a meeting was taking place <coughs> in the forest. The family didn't want any more people should come in. They were afraid they can save their life, but with many people, what are they going to do? How are they going to obtain food? They haven't got any rifles, they haven't got any ammunition. And there was to Vyabelsky and a soil and the newcomers, which was Levin. And so was his brother. Soil was his brother, and Levin. And they decided, come what it may, they must save as many Jews as humanly possible. Whether they are old, young, crippled, or whatever it is, we will manage to survive somehow. We will manage to, to take as much food from the farmers as possible, and we will manage to, to fight the Germans. 